And I just want to start by saying thank you to the fabulous speakers um, in this afternoon's session. I think we had a real breath and also great depth. So now we open it up to questions, and I thought I might take Chair's prerogative um, and actually ask Matt. I've lost him. Where is he? He's over there. There he is. Matt, my question about, um, I thought your comment about the combination of biomarkers, I was wondering whether you could elaborate on that slide that you sort of flipped through. You sort of, you talked about CD14, but I was also sort of tau, and then there was GFAP. So could you elaborate a little bit more about combinations and whether there are potential combinations that you think might be key? Yeah, thank you. Um, so it is possible to measure them in combination relatively simply with um, sort of multiplex assays that exist and there's one by Quantrix that measures a number of those things. Um, preliminary data for some of them isn't great. Um, the ones I presented are some of the more promising ones. Um, it seems like, I mean it's really early days and this could change, but it seems like NFL is probably going to be a lot stronger than some of the others okay. in terms of risk prediction. Uh, but it's still quite early days. Uh, we haven't yet measured them all on a large enough sample to make sort of solid conclusions. Other questions? Amy. Say is that Nicola was really modest in her presentation. I don't think she, I think it's important to for people to realise how she's really led this field. And even though a lot of those papers are still coming out now because of her tireless work, it's been really influential on researchers in terms of developing clinical trials, thinking about how to implement exercise studies, and it's starting to change uh, behaviours. I think um, certainly with the Pisces study, we were, we're very lucky that Nicola's been able to give her very complimenting us on the good things and gently guiding us away from the bad things in her imitable Matt fashion. Um, Matt, sorry, I've got another question for you. Uh, it's about the blood biomarkers. You said that um, for prediction of risk, blood might be just as good as better than CSF, which I love. Um, uh, tell us why you think that and how. I mean, obviously we all want the blood test that predicts our dementia risk. Yeah, so it's based on data in which we have CSF and blood collected from the same people on the same day. And these people are followed up for risk of MCI, risk of dementia. And when we look at a head-to-head -head of how CSF and plasma compare, they're pretty comparable. Um, CSF seems to have slightly better precision, but um, their sort of point estimates are pretty comparable. And, you know, that slight gain that you get in precision is obviously offset by the invasiveness of the sampling. Um, so this is, I think, quite promising for, for some markers. I think it's um, interesting from the perspective that a lot of the time, so for example, when we submitted this work originally, uh, some of the criticisms were, why would you even look at this because it doesn't correlate with CSF? Um, and that was something that a lot of people said, but uh, which looked, forced us to sort of actually run this validation study where we did compare it against CSF and did look at how the two compared the risk of dementia. And in finding that they were relatively comparable in that respect, even though they didn't correlate with each other, I think it's quite interesting moving forward. And perhaps we need to think about how we validate biomarkers in the future, given that funding. Other questions? Tony. Yeah, I was just following that up. So the neurofilament light and the tau, do you think this is just secondary to neurons dying and their axonal contents kind of spilling out into the plasma, in which case, how early are they predictive? Are they in terms of going back to MCI and really early? Do you have to have a certain number of neurons have died before these markers start to be significant? That's a good question. I think that that more or less is the mechanism by which this is happening. So you're, you're getting this damage and it leaks to CSF and then links into the plasma. And the correlations that lack between the two might be due to different turnover rates of the different fluids. Um, but I think that, well, in our study, certainly we predicted risk of dementia in 10 years. So uh, we were able to predict quite far out. And the sample that I mentioned where we looked at the endophenotypes of uh, you know, hippocampal volume or, or cognition we're in people who are as young as 30. Uh, so still predicting uh, outcomes that are important uh, in people who were non-demented, uh, who didn't show any signs of cognitive impairment. Uh, so it might be sensitive to rather sort of subclinical damage in the brain as well in the early stages. 
Uh, no. Um, so, I mean, uh, our analysis looked at um, sort of differential effects by different genetic factors, um, but it's certainly a lot of scope to do more in that area. I'm, more, I'm allowed to. I organised the symposium, so I can have <laughs> um, Scott, this one's for you. She's two for you. When I, was, when I was at medical school, I was taught that calcium influx was the final common pathway for cellular death. You're telling me it's iron-mediated? That's apoptosis. Okay, so apoptosis for ferroptosis, it's iron mediated. Not involved in calcium. Okay. And apoptosis is unlikely to be the cell death mechanism involved in neurodegeneration. Yep, yep. And so on that, I um, mean, there's been quite a bit of work recently, completely separate from this, on neuronal mosaicism in the sense that obviously different um, areas of the brain seem to express their genetics very differently. Do you think that, have you seen that there's any areas that are more vulnerable in the brain to ferroptosis? Is there any work that's been done on that? It's a great question. It's a lot of work we're doing in the lab um, about why some areas might be more vulnerable than others. Um, certainly there are areas with more iron in the brain than others, particularly basal ganglia areas. Um, but they're also likely to be the areas that are protected against uh, iron lesions as well because they've got that higher baseline iron. Look, we're looking at um, several genes and receptors that uh, are involved in the ferroptosis pathway and we can also link to Alzheimer's disease and their expression pattern in, in particularly the hippocampus as, re as it relates to Alzheimer's disease. Uh, in another presentation, I can talk about that, but it's uh, quite a long conversation. I had, a quick, I had a quick question actually, just to follow up on, with Scott as well. Um, I just wondered if you could tell us a little bit more about the, I thought your, your, your data on the haptoglobin sounds sort of interesting. I don't know anything about how it's dynamically sort of regulated. So the levels that you detect, is that stable levels? So we could detect haptoglobin levels in all people in CSF. So there is a basal level of haptoglobin. I suspect it is there in case you do have haemoglobin leakage into the CSF so that it can be there to mop up. Yeah. Um, it, the behaviour of haptoglobin in the CSF is very different to the plasma. Yeah. So certainly haptoglobin is, uh, is quite a, 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 an abundant protein in plasma as well. Yeah. But actually the levels decrease when it sees uh, red, uh, red blood cells, uh, it sees haemoglobin, sorry, because it finds the haemoglobin is going to be taken up and then removed by the spleen. Uh, but in the CSF it's different because we don't have that same apparatus. And what we see is that it looks like there's an inflammation response and this causes the upregulation of haptoglobin to um, respond to the, the haemoglobin that's unusually present in the CSF. You shouldn't see haemoglobin in the CSF ordinarily. Okay. And has, has there been any um, work in animal models that have tracked changes in, in haptoglobin at all? Uh, this data is only gold. So this is, this is, we haven't thought about translating it to animals yet. Yeah, okay, interesting. Matt? I have a oh, question. Okay. And, then, and then Matt, okay, we'll Nicola. go with you first and then Matt, yeah. Um, in terms of like implementation stage in your program right now, uh, what kind of strategies have you looked at in terms of implementing the resistance training component? Because aerobic, exercise is sort of more relatable to our everyday life, but what kind of strategies have you come across or are testing? Very good question. Um, so I think it depends obviously uh, on where you want to implement it, um, but the projects we are starting now, we, um, they are for community patients from Melbourne Health and St. Vincent's. So they're all clients, but they live at home. Um, and the idea is that you, uh, um, you, implementation basically means you want to use the staff you have and not add on lots of staff so that when you remove the project it still keeps going. So we are basically using the hospital gyms um, and the physiotherapists there to give uh, all the clients who are happy to try that uh, a demonstration how they can do. Uh, resistance training and then we also give them equipment they can keep at home uh, so you know that will be resistance bands um, they get a Fitbit that they can count their steps and because some of the challenges you will be laughing about that most clinicians in our hospitals are not adhering to the guidelines either <laughs> so every clinician like all the caseworkers get the same equipment 
<laughs> and we are saying, okay, maybe you try it yourself as well because then you will be more believable. Uh, and then the idea is that you, that they incl include that in their clinical pathways. So when they talk about other health issues, like their mental health, that they make time for at least 10 minutes where they talk about the guidelines. Um, but you can't do this without uh, demonstration sessions in the gyms with using then the hospital physiotherapy staff and luckily they're happy to give it a try and then we also do this in shared care collaboration with the general practitioners who are doctors of these clients so that's where um, the Department of Primary Care helps us then to work with uh, the GPs and also get evaluation from the GP whether that uh, you know is meant whether they feel they can maintain it once the client is discharged from the hospital service to still have that on the agenda when they regularly meet with them. So you're using like um, envisioning like a partially supervised model yeah. and then slowly weaning them into like an independent home So base. these clients are usually three months in the care of the community teams so we have three months sort of trying to implement that and then pass it on to the GP also train the GPs and then, you know, if we get further funding, we might check in you later, mm. has anything of that remained, but also changing uh, the knowledge and the attitude of the hospital staff, I think is very important. And so far, you know, start getting these things started, mm. you know, 99% of the staff are absolutely excited about this because um, they, they have, they feel they have often no good news and no, nothing which can help the patient to empower and this is a good news story for them. Okay, I sense we've got two burning questions and then we'll wrap it up. So Matt first. Thanks, good question about stroke hook. Um, what percentage of studies have whole genome sequencing and case ascertainment for post-stroke dementia? So how, many how many of the studies have whole genome sequencing and case ascertainment for post-stroke dementia? I don't have that information at, say, uh, at this moment. Is um, we we basically wait for a researcher to submit a project proposal, and then we might send a um, query out to our members and get that information in. Um, but for example, GWAS data, we know that we have maybe three studies, so not very many. Thanks. Okay, and we'll just get one last one. I'm really sorry, but we'll be around. Okay. Uh, I have a question for because I saw you mentioned uh, the 15 minutes moderates and 90 minutes feverish activity, is that per day, per week? That's per week. And do we have to do that in one, one time, or can they just smear it out of the week? Uh, they can, you, know, you can do it, sorry, you can do it in 10 minutes intervals whenever you find time. That's yeah. the nice thing about the flexibility. Um, and this is the minimum. So, you know, if you look at some guidelines, if the younger you are, the more you should do. So you read between 150 and 300, between 90 and 120. Um, but, you know, it's across the week and whenever people find time. Fantastic. Okay, we'll wrap that up. Thank you so much, everyone, in this session. And I'll leave it to Amy to wrap it up. So that does conclude our proceedings. Um, I'd just like to thank all of our speakers again because that was a fantastic session. So thank you.